Uh, by the summer of 1970, the U.S. military had been in Vietnam in one form or another for nearly 15 years. Richard Nixon had taken office the previous year, sworn in at the beginning in 1969, promising to, to finally end that endless war in Vietnam. But uh, there, of course, was no sign that it was ending by the following year, 1970. And on June 21st, 1970, this was the story on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, the headline, War Stirs More Dissent Among GIs. Quote, as the war in Vietnam drags on, the army is finding itself increasingly plagued by a growing struggle of another sort against dissidents in its own ranks. The ultimate aim of the dissidents, who are aided by civilian radicals, is to stop the war machine. They want to end the war in Indochina, bring all American troops back from overseas, and democratize the U.S. Army. They are also seeking to create a radical force in the military that will carry its commitment back into civilian life. These are the men who are publishing the GI underground newspapers, organizing protests and peace demonstrations, working closely in many base areas across the country with at least eight coffee houses and with other projects sponsored by such civilian support organizations as the United States Servicemen's Fund. GI coffee houses. Hmm. Starting in the late 60s, continuing right through the end of the Vietnam War, uh, individual anti-war activists and, and organizations like the United States Servicemen's Fund, they established these, these coffee houses, these gathering spots sited near U.S. Army bases across the country that were basically trying to support and build anti-war sentiment among serving soldiers. The idea was to give service members a place nearby the base, not too far out of the way, where they could safely vent their frustrations with the military or vocalize their opposition to the Vietnam War or connect with civilian activists to organize against the war. The Times reported in 1970 that the U.S. Servicemen's Fund, USSF, um, was providing assistance to these coffee houses, to anti-war underground newspapers, and to other anti-war projects. The Times interviewed one regional coordinator for that fund, um, made sure to point out that, quote, he wears the mustache and moderately long hair now in style in the movement. You know what that means. The following year, in 1971, the actress Jane Fonda uh, and a troupe of other actors and comedians actually did a tour of the GI coffee houses with musical performances and readings and skits. The Times filed a report from one of their stops from a servicemen's fund run uh, coffee house called the Haymarket Square near Fort Bragg in North Carolina. In one skit, as the Times reported it, Jane Fonda played First Lady Pat Nixon. And in the skit, she rushes in to tell her husband, the president, that there's a massive demonstration outside preparing to storm the White House. And the President Nixon character says, Oh, I'd better call the army. Jane Fonda slash Pat Nixon says, you can't, Richard. And he says, why not? And then Jane Fonda with the punchline, Dick, it is the army out there. So these, these coffee houses, this slice of the anti-Vietnam War movement, uh, this, this provocative organizing effort targeting serving GIs, it started to get a bunch of media attention. Once it started to get a bunch of media attention, it then started to get congressional attention. And that got really aggressive really fast. The Senate convened hearings into whether the U.S. Servicemen's Fund was engaging in activities harmful to the morale of the U.S. Armed Forces. And then the Senate subpoenaed the bank that the U.S. Servicemen's Fund used as its bank, uh, demanding their financial records. And the U.S. Servicemen's Fund fought back against that. Uh, this is how the case was described in the Journal of the American Bar Association in 1975. Quote, the Senate Subcommittee on Internal Security issued a subpoena to the bank uh, at, at which USSF had an account. The USSF brought suit to restrain enforcement of the subpoena and to prevent the bank from complying with the subpoena. The organization alleged that the sole purpose of the subpoena was to harass, chill, punish and deter the servicemen's fund in their exercise of their rights and duties under the First Amendment. The Senate Subcommittee on Internal Security. The Senate Subcommittee on Internal Security was the entity that issued the subpoena to the bank 
of this servicemen's fund that was running these coffee houses. The Senate Subcommittee on Internal Security is not considered to be one of the high points in proud American governance. It was kind of a, a Senate equivalent to the House Un-American Activities Committee. Um, this subcommittee on internal security in the Senate, it was ultimately abolished not long after in 1977. But for the two decades leading up to its abolition, um, it was chaired by the floridly white supremacist, segregationist Mississippi Senator James Eastland. Um, that's why this case involving the Servicemen's Fund and the anti-war GI coffee houses, uh, the case was actually called Eastland v. U.S. Servicemen's Fund. That case ended up going all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. It was decided in 1975 and ended up being sort of landmark Supreme Court case. It just, it's now recognized as a foundational piece of law when it comes to subpoenas from Congress. And the grounds on which you might challenge a subpoena from Congress, or you might resist one, or you might uh, decry one as improper and thereby get out of having to respond to it. And the reason it is seen as a foundational case in that regard is because the U.S. Servicemen's Fund, this group that was funding all these GI coffee houses, part of this whole part of the anti-war movement, uh, they lost that case in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that as long as the Congress is performing its legislative duty, which necessarily includes investigations relating to all sorts of things, including the functioning of the armed services or any other part of the U.S. government, as long as they are pursuing a legislative duty, then the question of why Congress is undertaking any particular investigation or issuing any particular subpoena, it's none of the court's business. Um, this is from a concurring opinion in the case uh, by the great Justice Thurgood Marshall. Quote, a court's inquiry in such a setting is necessarily quite limited. If the senator's actions were within the legitimate legislative sphere, the matter ends there and they are answerable no further to the court. I mean, you could be forgiven here if the side you were rooting for was the, you know, the anti-war activists funding these little GI coffee shops near army bases, right? If your sympathies here were not with the segregationist white supremacist senator who was running his own personal dissent smashing subcommittee in the U.S. Senate. I also think it's fair to assume that Justice Thurgood Marshall, who wrote the concurring opinion in this case, he was not a huge fan of James Eastland and most of the things that James Eastland did in the U.S. Senate. But th so much more to the point here that the settled law here ever since 1975, reaffirmed over and over again since then, is that even when Congress is terrible, even in the worst case scenario, when Congress is being a bunch of freaking jerks, even when Congress plainly is issuing subpoenas in what is obviously terrible bad faith, even when they are at rock bottom in terms of their credibility and what they are trying to do, they have absolute authority to do what they want to do. The courts may or may not like why a particular committee or subcommittee in Congress is seeking some kind of information, but they're Congress. They are a co-equal branch of government. They get to decide on their own terms what they want to look into. And the courts, as a co-equal branch of government, they don't get to weigh in on whether a subpoena idea from Congress is noble or sober or wicked or dumb. What Congress investigates is up for Congress to decide. And how Congress subpoenas information is Congress's decision. And that clear precedent, that clear and unequivocal precedent, means that our president now, today, did something desperate <laughs> that is destined to fail and fail quickly. When the president today decided that he was going to bring a personal lawsuit against Congress. Uh, President Trump, in his personal capacity today, sued Congress, sued the Oversight Committee in the House for them having the temerity to issue a subpoena for his financial records from an accounting firm that spent a lot of years doing various types of financial work for him, including preparing his taxes. I mean, even if it were a super far-fetched investigation that they were pursuing, what the case law in this 
area tells us is that the courts would still stay out of it. But in this case, it's not that far-fetched. I mean, the president's longtime personal lawyer just testified to Congress under oath that President Trump committed multiple financial felonies, and he pointed them to the documents that would show evidence of that. Kind of seems like there might be a really good reason for Congress to see those records. And yes, so the, the president filed this lawsuit today trying to block the Oversight Committee from subpoenaing these years of records from his longtime accounting firm. You can see in the lawsuit that the Oversight Committee chairman, Elijah Cummings, is personally the named defendant in that lawsuit from the president today. But uh, as much as I'm sure the president's lawyers are enjoying the billable hours, uh, billable hours here, uh, this lawsuit appears on track to fail and without much suspense. This is an area of the law where it's, there just isn't that much gray. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. Don't hire me for anything. But um, <laughs> to, to, once the president did this today, uh, we spoke with a number of people today who are lawyers, including experts in the field, and they told us to a one, this is not an area of law where there is any wiggle room. Um, this lawsuit may be an effort by the president to slow things down, but it's certainly not going to stop what Congress is doing. Congressman Elijah Cummings, for his part, uh, responded to this lawsuit against him today by saying there is simply no valid legal basis to interfere with this duly authorized subpoena from Congress. This complaint reads more like political talking points than a reasoned legal belief. Uh, in terms of the target of the subpoena, Trump's accounting firm, Mazars, uh, they say only that they will, quote, respect the legal process and fully comply with our legal obligations. And that in an uncomplicated way, would include complying with a legal congressional subpoena. So, I mean, we sort of know how this is going to end. It is fascinating that the president is spending his own money, we presume, to try to end this. He, he, he really, really, really does not want Congress to see his finances. In addition to this lawsuit to try to stop the subpoena to his accounting firm, the president has hired a whole team of lawyers that is specifically and only working on the task of keeping his taxes and finances secret. I mean, that's their whole job. That's who's doing this lawsuit for him concerning the Mazar subpoena. That is presumably who is also going to do the other lawsuits that he will file like this for the other subpoenas that will pursue other elements of the president's financial history. That same team of lawyers has already written multiple letters to the IRS telling the IRS that they shouldn't comply with the demand for Trump's tax returns. That's been issued by the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Again, though, in this case, the, the law is not gray. The law is very clear cut. The IRS is required under law to hand over those returns as requested by that committee chairman. But they're sending threatening legal sounding letters trying to slow the whole thing down. Presumably we expect similar letters, uh, if not additional lawsuits to Deutsche Bank and all the other financial institutions that have worked with the president who were recently subpoenaed by, uh, chairman, uh, by the chairs of various house committees. Uh, congressional Democrats are just going ahead and, and, and pushing forward with investigating this stuff. Despite the fact that the president seems fairly desperate to pull out all the stops to try to block them, slow them down somehow, even when it's clearly legally pointless <laughs> in the end for him to fight this in some of the ways that he is. I mean, the, the question that Democrats are wrestling with right now is, is not whether or how much investigating to do. It sort of seems like they're all on board with that. The question now for Democrats is whether their ongoing and increasingly aggressive investigations should stay under the rubric of congressional oversight of the executive branch, as they have been doing, or whether they should pursue some of these investigations and pursue some of this fact-finding under the rubric of an impeachment inquiry. Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts on Friday night became the first Democratic presidential candidate to say that an impeachment inquiry should begin in the House based on the findings of Robert Mueller's redacted report, which were made public last week. This weekend, Elijah Cummings, Congressman Adam Schiff of the Intelligence Committee, Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler, whose committee would, of course, be the venue for an impeachment inquiry, they all kind of edged up to the line of considering an impeachment inquiry, but they ultimately said they weren't there yet. House Democrats held a conference call among themselves tonight to discuss how they might move forward. The upshot of which, according to people on the call, was that the committee chairs committed to conducting aggressive and extensive investigations and oversight of the president, but they did not commit to opening an impeachment inquiry, at least not yet. In terms of that oversight and in terms of these various congressional investigations, Democratic committee chairs plan to summon a number of interesting witnesses in the days ahead. 
including newly appointed Attorney General Bill Barr and the special counsel himself, Robert Mueller, and the FBI director, Chris Wray. And now, as of tonight, the House Judiciary Chairman has issued a brand new subpoena to former White House counsel Don McGahn. Now, this is a big deal. Um, this subpoena to Don McGahn marks the first subpoena to any Trump White House employee, current or former, since Mueller's report became public. Uh, calls on McGahn to hand over documents and testify at a hearing on May 21st. If you were planning on going on vacation in the third week in May, you should cancel that. If the Don McGahn testimony is happening on May 21st, you're going to want to watch that. Don McGahn is what seems to be the key witness in at least three obstruction of justice incidents laid out in painstaking detail by the special counsel in his redacted report. These include Trump asking McGahn to, to tell the Attorney General Jeff Sessions that he should unrecuse himself from overseeing the Russia investigation. Trump also ordering Don McGahn to reach out to the Justice Department about firing Robert Mueller as special counsel. The president later pressuring Don McGahn to deny <laughs> that he had ever received that order from the president once word of it leaked to the New York Times. McGahn is, of course, memorably quoted in the Mueller report saying that he needed to quit. He needed to leave the White House and leave the job of White House counsel because the president was asking him to do crazy uh, 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 rhymes with spit. So, I mean, if Don McGahn is going to testify on May 21st, that you will want to see that. Um, in, terms of attorney, in terms of attorney client privilege and executive privilege, there will certainly be a fight over that. But remember, the White House counsel is not the president's lawyer. The White House counsel is the lawyer for the office of the president and the sort of attorney client privilege protections that might attend to the president and some lawyer who was working directly for him, not as White House counsel, uh, will not be available way that Donald Trump might want. So we, we shall see how the Democrats decide to settle the issue of whether they're going to investigate all this stuff in the context of an impeachment inquiry or whether they will continue with traditional oversight responsibilities. Uh, but one of the reasons the lawmakers seem pretty well justified in demanding particularly the president's financial information, um, even as he sort of freaks out in response to these demands. One of the reasons that this line of inquiry seems sort of different and maybe more important even than all the others is that they'll be plumbing these depths for the first time. It appears that Robert Mueller's special counsel investigation, this huge criminal investigation, just concluded without Mueller having looked at Trump's finances at all. And given what a key issue money and influence could be in the counterintelligence matter at the heart of the Russia investigation, it doesn't seem crazy that Congress would feel the need to look at this stuff if they're trying to get to the bottom of this scandal overall. <laughs> I mean, that said, remember, though, in terms of the case law here, even if Congress was being totally crazy, even if this was just a total wild hair and they were doing this out of sheer animus toward the president, it would probably still be fine. <laughs> the president would still lose in a court fight against a congressional subpoena. You know, e even if it came from some old racist Senator Eastland personal activist targeting committee, right? It doesn't matter even if Congress is pursuing things along lines that a court might find disingenuous or objectionable. If Congress is pursuing this stuff, subpoenas work. And in this case, following the money doesn't seem crazy. I mean, we know that Robert Mueller didn't follow the money. There was a counterintelligence component to the Mueller investigation. He did not produce a counterintelligence report on the findings of that investigation. Instead, we learned from Mueller's redacted report that he took all the information his investigators gathered that didn't fit into the criminal investigation, and he sent it out to the FBI for them to deal with it in some other way. This is from Mueller's redacted report, quote, from its inception, the special counsel's office recognized that its investigation could identify foreign intelligence and counterintelligence information relevant to the FBI's broader national security mission. FBI personnel who assisted the office established procedures to identify and convey such information to the FBI. The FBI's counterintelligence division met with the special counsel's office regularly for that purpose for most of the tenure of the special counsel. For more than the past year, the FBI embedded personnel at the special counsel's office who didn't work on the special counsel's investigation, but whose purpose was to review the results of the investigation and to send, in writing, summaries of foreign intelligence and counterintelligence information to FBI headquarters and FBI field offices. 
Those communications and other correspondence between the special counsel's office and the FBI contain information derived from the investigation, not all of which is contained in this volume. This volume is a summary. It contains in the special counsel's office's judgment information necessary to account for the special counsel's prosecution and declination decisions and to describe the investigation's main factual results. In other words, this isn't the counterintelligence investigation. In other words, the special counsel's report, Robert Mueller's redacted report last week, says we developed all kinds of information in the course of this investigation that we're not going to put in our report here because it doesn't pertain directly to criminal cases. This is just about potential federal crimes being committed. This is not the report of our counterintelligence investigation. That said, we turned up some intelligence information and counterintelligence information. We shoved that all off to the FBI. NBC News reported late last week that the FBI's counterintelligence investigation of the Trump team and Russia is still active now. House Intelligence Committee under Congressman Adam Schiff has made clear that they expect a full briefing on what has been found thus far in that ongoing counterintelligence investigation. And I mean, clearly some of what Mueller found does have intelligence consequences, does have consequences in terms of thinking about the prospect that people in the government or people associated with the Trump campaign may have potentially been compromised by a foreign power. I mean, we now have all this new detail about Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort and his right-hand man from Manafort's years in Ukraine, Konstantin Kalimnik. Mueller's prosecutors repeatedly asserted in court documents over the course of their investigation that the FBI had reason to believe that Kalimnik has ongoing ties to Russian intelligence. Well, in his final redacted report, which we just got, Mueller lays out for the first time why it is that they think Konstantin Kalimnik is actually an agent of the Russian government. The report says, for example, that Kalimnik has been working on behalf of the Russian government in very recent years. For example, trying to get a Western PR company to, to sell a, what the Western press uh, some positive spin on Russia taking over Crimea. He's also been traveling on a Russian diplomatic passport. Oh. Uh, we, in that context, we still don't know why in 2016 during the campaign, Paul Manafort repeatedly gave this guy, Kalimnik, months and months and months of internal Trump campaign polling data, repeatedly. He also gave Kalimnik, quote, the status of the Trump campaign and Manafort's strategy for winning Democratic votes in Midwestern states. Manafort also briefed Kalimnik on, quote, the campaign's messaging including battleground states, which Manafort identified as Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Minnesota. I mean, what was all that about? I mean, th this guy that Mueller is telling us all these reasons why he believe, they believe that he's assessed to be linked to Russian intelligence and he's actively working with the Russian government, including traveling on a Russian diplomatic passport and all the rest of it. Why is that guy getting months of internal polling data and everything from the Trump campaign about how they're planning on winning the election? targeting Democratic voters, their Midwestern strategy, their last, their end of the campaign messaging stuff. Why did they need all that stuff? Why was that all going to Russia? I mean, is that some of the counterintelligence stuff of Mueller's, from Mueller's work that we have not seen? There's also something that broke on Friday night, which seems relevant to all of this stuff and seems like reason enough to pursue the counterintelligence part of this investigation wherever it leads. Uh, Maria Butina is scheduled to be sentenced on Friday of this week for working as a, a foreign agent in the U.S., infiltrating the NRA and conservative circles on behalf of the Russian government. Just as an example of the kind of thing that Congress might want to know more about, in Friday's sentencing memo from the government on Maria Butina, federal prosecutors lay out Butina's conversations on election night 2016 and in the days afterwards during the transition including specifically about who Donald Trump should nominate for Secretary of State, a position that eventually went to oil executive and Putin whisperer <laughs> Rex Tillerson. I mean, we had seen some of this in court filings before, but on Friday, prosecutors laid it out. Three days after the election, according to prosecutors, Butina, quote, provided the Russian official with the name of an individual she claimed was being considered for U.S. Secretary of State. She asked the Russian official to seek the input of the Russian government on the name she provided and told him, quote, our opinion will be taken into consideration in the United States. The Russian government's opinion will be taken into account, in, into consideration in the United States. 
as to who should be the Secretary of State, as to who Trump should put in the cabinet as Secretary of State? I mean, to the extent that this intelligence stuff was not reported on in Mueller's redacted report that we got last week, to the extent that the counterintelligence investigation, as NBC News reports, is not over, to the extent that this counterintelligence stuff is, is a live matter of inquiry that has, that has not been resolved, it's Congress, presumably, that is going to be trying to resolve it from here on out. And to the extent that this stuff is going to be pursued through the Intelligence Committee, through the FBI, through Congress, it turns out there is a problem with that. Uh, at the very, very top, and I do not mean Trump, and that story's next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.